Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Monroe Doctrine. Happy birthday to you. And many more. In honor of the bicentennial of the Monroe Doctrine, we present the top five Monroe Doctrine invocations. That's right, listeners. The Monroe Doctrine may be 200 years old, but it's still banging. Five! We're about to take a dive! Four! In the presidential law! Three! Who will fuck my face? Two! We're about to tell you! One! The show's out the gun! Welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I am James J. Hamilton. And I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And we're here with the top five Monroe Doctrine invocations. That's right, a very special top five to kick off season three of the Dead Presidents Podcast. That's right, we're here in the year 2023, taking you all the way back to 1823, when in his State of the Union address, President James Monroe laid out what would become one of the most important and enduring principles of American foreign policy. That's right. For 25 years, up until 1815, the fledgling United States had been caught between the warring powers of Europe and its foreign policy revolved around trying to maintain neutrality with honor, culminating in the War of 1812. In the next decade, with Europe at peace, the U.S. finally wrested Florida from Spain, while Mexico and most of Spain's South American colonies had won their independence. Monroe recognized them as sovereign nations, and the balance was shifting against European colonial influence in the Americas. The new policy Monroe announced in 1823 was something the U.S. had always desired, but now the time was right. That's it. Monroe is going to declare that the Western Hemisphere is an American sphere of influence and is off-limits for European powers. Now, this was drafted primarily by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, and the Monroe Doctrine goes on to state... Quote, the occasion has been judged proper for asserting, as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are involved, that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. We owe it, therefore, to candor and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and those powers to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other manner their destiny by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. Boom. President Monroe laying down the doctrine. That's it. Some of the European powers were upset at the time, but... Britain supported the doctrine because Britain wanted the former Spanish colonies to remain independent so that it could dominate trade with them. Latin American countries were generally supportive, but some far-sighted Latin Americans worried that European colonizers would be replaced by U.S. domination. That's it. The Monroe Doctrine would become a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy and would be cited by many future presidents, as the United States would itself become an expansionist imperialist power that eventually came to dominate the European powers that once dominated it. That's just it. And with that bit of backstory, let's dive headfirst into the Top 5 Monroe Doctrine Invocations. Number 5. Hawaii. Hawaii. 
the Monroe Doctrine, which was not initially referred to as the Monroe Doctrine, it lay somewhat dormant for the first couple of decades after Monroe's initial declaration, the U.S. remaining silent while Spain attempted to recapture Mexico and both Britain and France made claims to Argentina's Falkland Islands, but then, in 1842, President John Tyler became responsible for the first major reassertion of Monroe's principles. That's just it. Tyler, of course, as you remember from episode 10, was an expansionist. He tried to acquire ports in Mexico's California Territory, maneuvered to strengthen the U.S. claim to the Oregon Territory, achieve the annexation of Texas, opened trade with China, and expands the U.S. Navy. He also foresaw Hawaii's strategic importance as a naval base and station for Pacific trade, and he begins relations with the Hawaiian Islands that would lead to their eventual annexation by the U.S. in 1898. Yep, during the Tyler administration, the Kingdom of Hawaii sent diplomats around to the major world powers seeking formal recognition as an independent nation. Britain, France, the U.S., and others conducted trade with Hawaii, and each feared that the others might try to annex Hawaii as a colony. Hawaii had altercations with the French and British during this time, first after they had expelled French Catholics on the advice of Protestant missionaries, and then the French Navy forced them to reconsider... On another occasion, a hot-headed British naval commander briefly occupied the islands. But on the advice of American missionaries, Hawaii believed that the United States was its best bet to get formal recognition. That's just it, and John Tyler agrees with this. He recognizes Hawaiian independence and appoints the first U.S. consul to Hawaii. Recognition by Britain and France followed. In a special message to Congress in 1842, Without specifically mentioning Monroe or his declaration, Tyler declared that the same principles applied to European interference with Hawaiian independence. Quote, Far remote from the dominions of European powers, Hawaii's growth and prosperity as an independent state may yet be in a high degree useful to all whose trade is extended to those regions. While its near approach to this continent and the intercourse with American vessels have with it, such vessels constituting five-sixths of all which annually visit it could not but create dissatisfaction on the part of the United States at any attempt by another power, should such attempt be threatened or feared, to take possession of the islands, colonize them, and subvert the native government. Considering, therefore, that the United States possesses so large a share of the intercourse with those islands, it is deemed not unfit to make the declaration that their government seeks. Nevertheless, no peculiar advantages, no exclusive control over the Hawaiian government, but is content with its independent existence and anxiously wishes for its security and prosperity. Its forbearance in this respect, under the circumstances of the very large intercourse of their citizens with the islands, would justify this government, should events hereafter arise to require it, in making a decided remonstrance against the adoption of an opposite policy by any other power. Well, there you have it. Yeah, and of course, when John Tyler refers to intercourse between Hawaii and the United States, he is not talking about sex. No, it's more commercial intercourse. That's right. Yeah, and this is somewhat known as the Tyler Doctrine, the expansion of the Monroe Doctrine to cover Hawaii. Tyler here saying, look, we're not going to annex Hawaii, but neither is anybody else. Right. We have the biggest uh, interest in Hawaii. We're going to leave it independent, but everyone else better as well. That's just or it. you're going to have a problem with us. Yeah. So uh, this is really the first time that the Monroe Doctrine is really kind of brought up and enforced here. Yep. But it's going to become a trend. Indeed it is, and that's going to bring us to the top five Monroe Doctrine invocations. Number four. Oregon. Yep, here we are a few years later. In 1845, President James K. Polk will become the first president to explicitly reiterate Monroe's principles and reaffirm them as an American policy. 
he's going to be name dropping President Monroe. That's it. He's going to do so in the context of a dispute over the Oregon Territory, which consisted of what is now the states of Oregon and Washington and the Canadian province of British Columbia. At one time, four different countries asserted claims to all or part of the Oregon Territory, Britain, Spain, Russia, and the United States. Spain had ceded its claim to the United States by treaty. Russia had relinquished its own claim. And an 1818 treaty placed Oregon under joint occupation by Britain and the United States. But come the 1840s, yeah, it's time for the status quo to change. That's just it. Uh, the U.S. wants a partition at the 49th parallel, but Britain wants the Columbia River as the boundary. In between was the Puget Sound, the most vital harbor in the territory, which both sides wanted. In the late 1830s, the Oregon Trail opened up a flood of immigration by American settlers into the region. When the Tyler administration concluded the Webster-Ashburton Treaty resolving lots of boundary disputes with Britain, they kept the Oregon question open because the Americans felt their bargaining position would only get better as more and more Americans populated the territory. By the time James K. Polk takes office, he feels the time is right to strike. That's right. Polk proposed to the British a partition at the 49th parallel, and as expected, the British immediately refused. But the 1818 Joint Occupation Treaty allowed either country to give one year's notice to end the joint occupation. In his 1845 State of the Union Address, Polk asked Congress to give notice. And after noting that Oregon was part of the North American continent, he quoted Monroe's original statement that the American continents are not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. That's right. And he went on to say, quote, In the existing circumstances of the world, the present is deemed a proper occasion to reiterate and reaffirm the principle avowed by Mr. Monroe, and to state my cordial concurrence in its wisdom and sound policy. The reassertion of this principle, especially in reference to North America, is at this day but the promulgation of a policy which no European power should cherish the disposition to resist. Existing rights of every European nation should be respected, but it is due alike to our safety and our interest that the efficient protection of our laws should be extended over our whole territorial limits, and that it should be distinctly announced to the world as our settled policy that no future European colony or dominion shall with our consent be planted or established on any part of the North American continent. Boom. Mm -hmm. Polk went on to tell Senator Thomas Hart Benton that he worried that Britain also had its eye on California, and that, in reasserting Mr. Monroe's doctrine, I had California and the fine Bay of San Francisco as much in view as Oregon. Congress follows Polk's lead and gives notice to end the joint occupation of Oregon in April 1846, giving the two countries a year to negotiate a settlement with war on the table should they not reach an agreement. That's right. Polk didn't assert a claim to the entire Oregon Territory, although the Democratic Party platform did assert such a claim, and enough Americans were hawkish about the issue that support grew for claiming all of Oregon, all the way up to 54 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude. The popular slogan was 5440 or fight. That's just it, and this fervor is going to put Polk in pretty good negotiating position because it seems like the American people are going to be on his side if he wants to play hardball. Polk's aggressive move worked as it prompted the British to ask to reopen negotiations. Polk was unwilling unless the British made a proposal. The American ambassador let it be known that the United States would look favorably on a British offer to partition at the 49th parallel, Polk's original offer that had been flatly rejected. Britain didn't want to go to war over this distant territory, and so they offered to divide Oregon at the 49th parallel, provided that they could keep all of Vancouver Island, which extended 
a little below the 49th, and that they could also retain navigation rights to the Columbia River until the expiration of the Hudson's Bay Company Charter in 1859. That's it. Polk is going to accept the offer, and the Senate ratified the proposed treaty. Well, that's a hell of a negotiation. Yeah. You start off with an offer that they totally reject, and you end up getting them to beg you to accept that same offer. Yeah. Pretty shrewd move. That's the Monroe Doctrine for you in there. You know, it's supposed to apply to, they always say, you know, existing European claims will be respected, but not more. And in this case, probably Britain would claim that its claim to Oregon was pre-existing. Yeah. But the U.S., with a hawkish claim to Oregon, implying that if the British are going to push on it, then you're making new claims. And we're not having that. That's just it. This is our hemisphere. So you can get out. That's going to bring us to an honorable mention. That's it. Mexico. Yeah, let's take a look at Mexico. In 1861, with the U.S. preoccupied by the Civil War, France blatantly violated the Monroe Doctrine by occupying Mexico and installing a puppet government. That's right. The U.S. pretty busy during the Civil War at this time. So for a few years there, one of the most notable non-invocations of the Monroe Doctrine. But after the war, we'll get around to invoking it. Afterwards, many Americans, including President Andrew Johnson, favored an invasion of Mexico to oust the French. That's it. In fact, that was one of the crazy um, proposals made by the South there at the end of the war when they're trying to negotiate some kind of peace. It was like, hey, what's what's the thing everyone can agree on? both the Confederates and the Union, that France shouldn't be in Mexico. Right. So let's band together to kick out the French. Not going to fly as a war-ending proposal, but after the war, we're not going to let the French remain That's in it. Mexico. President Johnson is going to defer to Secretary of State William Seward, who favors a diplomatic approach and sternly warns the French that their presence in Mexico is unacceptable. Napoleon III agrees to withdraw French troops within 18 months, hoping that by then, his puppet government could consolidate its power against Republican insurgents. But the U.S. supplies the Republican rebels with arms, recognizing the Republican leader as the legitimate president of Mexico. And they also station a Union army under General Philip Sheridan on the Texas border. Under this pressure, the French position soon collapses, French troops are withdrawn, and their puppet emperor was executed by a Mexican firing squad. Nice. Seward proclaimed that, quote, the Monroe Doctrine, which eight years ago was merely a theory, is now an irreversible fact. And that it is, as we are going to find out as we proceed on our list of The Top 5 Monroe Doctrine Invocations. Number 3. Venezuela. In 1895, the United States became involved in a border dispute between Venezuela and British Guiana, which had been a British colony since before Monroe's announcement of the initial doctrine. When Britain refused to submit certain portions of the boundary dispute to arbitration, Venezuela requested U.S. assistance. But the U.S. initially only encouraged the parties to resume amicable relations. Things took a turn, however, in July 1895 when President Grover Cleveland's new Secretary of State, Richard Olney, got involved. He took a new approach to the dispute and used the issue to announce a forceful new interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine. That's just it. Without consulting Venezuela at all, only wrote to the British Foreign Secretary demanding that Britain submit the entire dispute to arbitration and arguing that there is, quote, a doctrine of American public law, well-founded in principle and abundantly sanctioned by precedent, which entitles and requires the United States to treat as an injury to itself the forcible assumption by an European power of political control over an American state. Only goes on to state that, quote, today the United States is practically sovereign on this continent, and its fiat 
is law upon the subject to which it confines its interposition. Here, the subject is the boundary dispute. That's right, and if we want to interpose, our fiat is law. That's just it. The initial British response was to deny that the Monroe Doctrine was international law. They refused to recognize U.S. standing in the dispute, and they argued that Olney's position was tantamount to the assertion of a protectorate over all of Latin America. Hmm. The British also argued that if the United States indeed enjoyed the privilege it was asserting, then it should also have, quote, the duty of answering for the conduct of these Latin American states and consequently the responsibility of controlling it. Hmm. That's going to lead to December 17th, 1895, when President Cleveland responds to the British position by delivering a special message to Congress. Drafted by Olney, it argues that the Monroe Doctrine did apply here and urging Congress to appropriate funds for a commission to investigate the boundary dispute. And it declares that, quote, It will, in my opinion, be the duty of the United States to resist by every means in its power, as a willful aggression upon its rights and interests, the appropriation by Great Britain of any lands, or the exercise of governmental jurisdiction over any territory which, after investigation, we have determined of right belongs to Venezuela. <laughs> In making these recommendations, I am fully alive to the responsibility incurred and keenly realize all the consequences that may follow. Damn. Yeah. That right there at the end sounds like the kind of language that goes back and forth in dueling letters. Right. I will abide the consequences. I think that's what some of the Hamilton Bird dueling letters say. Yeah. And you know what that means. You better do what we ask or... You may be prepared to use force. That's just it. Congress unanimously agreed to appropriate the money, uh, and Cleveland appointed an all-American commission to investigate the boundary. Cleveland's implied threat of war got Britain's attention, and it soon recognized U.S. standing in the dispute. The U.S. agreed to suspend the all-American commission, and Britain agreed to submit the dispute to the arbitration of a five-member panel, with two members chosen by the U.S., two by Britain, and the fifth member chosen by the first four panelists. That fifth member would end up being a Russian diplomat. And the lawyer who ended up representing Venezuela at the arbitration was, of course, as our listeners may recall, ex-president Benjamin Harrison. That's it, and the amount of work that he put into it. Boy. Well, he was disappointed in the result because the arbitrators ruled largely in favor of Britain's position. But nevertheless, it was still a victory for the United States, which was more concerned with vindicating its own right to intervene than with defending Venezuela's particular interests. That's it. The right of the U.S. to intervene and settle disputes between Latin America and European nations has been called the only corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Speaking of corollaries... That's it. That's going to bring us on down to the top five Monroe Doctrine invocations. Number two. The Roosevelt Corollary. Well, through a series of Latin American crises, President Theodore Roosevelt would take Olney's corollary to a new level and introduce a corollary of his own. That's right. In December 1902, he brought the U.S. to the brink of war with Germany over another situation in Venezuela, where a new regime stopped payment on the country's massive foreign debt, held mostly by British and German creditors. When Venezuela refused to negotiate, the British and German navies established a blockade. Roosevelt believed that European nations had a right to make claims against Latin American nations, but that any seizure of territory would violate the Monroe Doctrine. Britain was willing to arbitrate the dispute. Of course, they learned their lesson prior with the Oni incident. Indeed. <laughs> but Germany proposed to, quote, temporarily seize a Venezuelan port as a guarantee of payment 
Roosevelt was reminded of how Germany's temporary occupation of a Chinese port in 1898 had turned into a 99-year lease. Yeah. So he informed the German ambassador that if Germany seized any territory, he would be, quote, obliged to interfere by force if necessary. That's it. He had coincidentally sent Admiral George Dewey to the Caribbean to conduct training exercises with an unprecedentedly large fleet of U.S. warships. Though the German Navy was significantly larger as a whole, Dewey would vastly outnumber the Germans in the potential theater of action. The German ambassador did not initially convey Roosevelt's threat to the Kaiser until another German diplomat who knew Roosevelt well assured him that the president was, quote, not bluffing. That's right. We don't play games with the Monroe Doctrine. When the threat ended up being conveyed to Germany, its Reichstag voted secretly to accept arbitration, and the secret, unofficial nature of Roosevelt's threat allowed Germany to back down without losing face. Roosevelt would go on to decline the offer of Britain and Germany that he personally arbitrate the dispute, and instead he allowed the U.S. ambassador to Venezuela to represent Venezuela at the arbitration. That's right, and in doing so, Roosevelt forced Venezuela to accept fair repayment terms. He declared that if Venezuela did not abide by the agreement, he would enforce it himself, using U.S. military power if necessary. As much as he was determined to uphold the Monroe Doctrine against European powers, he was equally determined not to let Latin American countries, quote, hide behind the doctrine in order to shirk their obligations. That's right. What the British had responded to Olney a decade earlier, that if you're going to assert this, you're going to be responsible for these countries, TR's like, basically, fine. We'll do that. Yeah. In 1904, the same situation is going to replay itself in the Dominican Republic, where that country's government would default on its foreign debt, Germany angrily demanding repayment, once again Admiral Dewey holding the U.S. Navy in readiness nearby. The Kaiser now knows that Roosevelt is the guy to go to for these disputes. He sends him a flattering letter requesting that the U.S. place the Dominican Republic under American receivership. TR is going to negotiate an agreement whereby the U.S. would take control of the Dominican Customs House and ensure that its customs revenues are used to make debt payments. That's right. In his December 1904 State of the Union address, Roosevelt formally announced the policy that became known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Quote, all that this country desires is to see the neighboring countries stable, orderly, and prosperous. Any country whose people conduct themselves well can count upon our hearty friendship. If a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may in America, as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation. And in the Western Hemisphere, the inheritance of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to exercise of an international police power. And of course... When he's talking about impotence, he's not talking about penises. No. Whole countries. It's going to bring us to another honorable mention. The 1912 Lodge Corollary. A little-known corollary. In 1912, rumors that a Japanese corporation sought to acquire land in the Baja California region of Mexico, including a potential harbor that some alarmists feared could one day turn into a Japanese naval base, the U.S. Senate adopted a resolution proposed by Henry Cabot Lodge stating that the U.S. would view with, quote, grave concern any effort by a foreign corporation to acquire harbors or land in the Western Hemisphere that would lead to practical control by a foreign government. This resolution, known as the Lodge Corollary, 
was privately dismissed by President Taft as, quote, a bee in Lodge's bonnet, in which Taft stated that he felt no obligation to follow. That's it. A little less known, but still an important part of the history of the Monroe Doctrine. Another honorable mention. The good neighbor policy. With the threat of European imperialism reduced after World War I, the U.S. downplayed interventionism in order to improve relations with Latin American countries. In 1928, Coolidge's Under Secretary of State, J. Reuben Clark, produced the Clark Memorandum, which stated that the police power interventionism of the Roosevelt Corollary was totally separate from the Monroe Doctrine, which applied only to European interference. Franklin Roosevelt's administration pursued what became known as the good neighbor policy. The administration declared that, quote, no country has the right to intervene in the internal or external affairs of another and increased commercial ties and trade reciprocity with Latin America. The Monroe Doctrine was not to imply U.S. hegemony over Latin America, but rather cooperation between the U.S. and Latin America. During World War II, all Latin American countries cut ties with the Axis powers and sided with the Allies. However, the Cold War would bring the return of American interventionism. And we're going to see how that goes as we get down to the wire here on the Top 5 Monroe Doctrine Invocations. Number 1. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Yep, during the Cold War, the Monroe Doctrine would justify the U.S. policy of resisting the spread of Soviet communist influence in the Western Hemisphere. This policy led to the 1947 signing of the Rio Pact, a military alliance akin to NATO involving the U.S. and most Latin American nations, and in the 1948 establishment of the Organization of American States, which was envisioned as a League of Nations of the Americas. That's it. In the 1950s, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles believed that the Monroe Doctrine justified the CIA's clandestine support for a 1954 coup d'etat against the Soviet-leaning government of Guatemala. Dulles later argued that, quote, This intrusion of Soviet despotism was, of course, a direct challenge to our Monroe Doctrine, the first and most fundamental of our foreign policies. The CIA planned a similar operation against Fidel Castro's communist Cuba, resulting in the infamously failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. And tensions are going to continue to rise. That's right. Soviet cooperation with Cuba intensifies... And then on August 29th, 1962, President Kennedy said, quote, The Monroe Doctrine means what it has meant since President Monroe and John Quincy Adams enunciated it, and that is that we would oppose a foreign power extending its power to the Western Hemisphere, and that is why we oppose what is happening in Cuba today. That is why we have cut off our trade. That is why we worked in the organization of American states and in other ways to isolate the communist menace in Cuba. That is why we will continue to give a good deal of our effort and attention to it. There we go. When intelligence reports confirmed that the Soviets were providing to Cuba ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads on October 22, 1962, Kennedy announced that the U.S. would institute, quote, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba. The U.S. Navy blockaded Cuba, which the Soviets called, quote, an act of aggression and outright piracy. The Soviets indicated that their ships would ignore the blockade, implicitly challenging the U.S. to intercept them by force. Yeah. Now, shit may really hit the fan. Yeah, it's getting really serious. Perhaps more than any other time... Throughout the entire Cold War, yeah, these two world superpowers on the brink. Kennedy considered bombing and invading Cuba. Both sides braced for the mutually assured destruction of nuclear war. And the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev blinked. On October 27th, the Soviets agreed to remove all missiles from Cuba, while the U.S. agreed not to invade Cuba and also secretly agreed to remove its own missiles from Turkey and Italy. 
Yeah. So this is the Monroe Doctrine at its peak. That's right. In terms of, you know, the fact that nuclear war is on the line. Right. The highest stakes. And our That's justification good. behind our actions? Still Monroe. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. That was perhaps the height of the Monroe Doctrine. We're going to honorably mention what has happened since. 1965, the U.S. occupied the Dominican Republic to prevent a communist-backed revolution. President Lyndon Johnson announcing a policy that some called a new corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. He said, quote, revolution in any country is a matter for that country to deal with. It becomes a matter calling for hemispheric action only, repeat only, when the object is the establishment of a communistic dictatorship. That's it. In 1984, CIA Director Robert Gates defended the Reagan administration's aid to the Contras rebelling against a communist regime in Nicaragua, saying that to ignore the Nicaragua situation would be, quote, totally to abandon the Monroe Doctrine. Interesting. And while President George H.W. Bush avoided using the term Monroe Doctrine in 1989 when the U.S. overthrew Panama's authoritarian drug trafficking dictator Manuel Noriega, many considered it to be a textbook application of the Roosevelt Corollary. That's right. In 2013, Secretary of State John Kerry announced that, quote, the era of the Monroe Doctrine is over. But... It was reasserted in 2018 by President Donald Trump in a speech at the United Nations General Assembly. We take you now to a live clip from that speech. Here in the Western Hemisphere, we are committed to maintaining our independence from the encroachment of expansionist foreign powers. It has been the formal policy of our country since President Monroe that we reject the interference of foreign nations in this hemisphere and in our own affairs. There you have it. Pretty well spoken by President Trump there. Reports of the death of the Monroe Doctrine have been greatly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. It is still alive and well 200 years after its initial declaration by President Monroe. That's right. And that's going to bring us to the end of our top five this week. But... Don't fret, because we're going to be back with a lot more exciting top fives here on the Dead Presidents Podcast, for which I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I'm James J. Hamilton. Thanks for listening.